Hello and welcome back to this video. Today we'll be all talking about Azure OpenAI service and how we can leverage its embeddings. And we'll talk through the use cases, we'll look at some code, and then we walk through two actual practical examples, including the code, and I think it's gonna be a fun session. So first of all, let's get started with quickly, what are embeddings? And we can actually look this up on the OpenAI website. Um, they do a quite good explanation. And embeddings are basically a tool to compare the relatedness of two strings. So basically saying how similar are two pieces of strings. And in this case, a string could be a single word, maybe a sentence, or maybe even a full document. So it really depends on your use case. But what you can do with it is quite a variety of things. For example, you can use them to implement semantic search. You can use it to do clustering. You can use it to calculate recommendations. We'll do a short example on this today. You can use them for anomaly detection. You can use them to measure how, how diverse a certain corpus of text is. And you can obviously use them for classification. And OpenAI also, they give quite a bunch of good code examples. So check out their examples to see how you can do certain things with them. Now, in order to use them in Azure OpenAI service, let's go to the Azure OpenAI documentation, go to models, if we scroll down a little bit, we see the supported embedding models. And here we see which models are supported. But to be honest with you, the main model you want to be using is the text embeddings other two model in the latest version. This was introduced by OpenAI end of last year. And this is the most powerful and actually also economically most viable model. So in this case, as we can see here, embedding model works by taking a piece of text, shoving it into a, the embedding model, and out comes a vector that represents the embedding of the text that we inputted. So let's actually use this to do some fun things. So let's switch into VS Code, and I've prepared a little example here. In this case, I'm using uh, the LangChain library to abstract my embeddings model, and let's just quickly go through the code. Um, what we're doing is we're using the OpenAI um, SDK and we are using this to connect to the Azure OpenAI service. Um, uh, we'll, we'll show that in a second. And then we are using the land chain embeddings so that we can actually um, programmatically easily use them. And then lastly, even though in many use cases you might not want to do this manually, the library like LangChain typically abstracts this away, we are still importing here the cosine similarity function that we can actually use to compare embeddings. Now, in order to get started in authenticating connect to Azure OpenAI service, um, I use the .env to load from my environment the Azure OpenAI API base key and then the actual key. And what we need to do, as I showed in other posts and videos, we, call, we tell the system or OpenAI that we want to use Azure, we specify the API version, and we set the API base and the API key from our environment. So the API key is obviously the service access key that you can get in the Azure portal. And then here the API base is this string that should look like this, this web address. And then lastly, we can initialize our embeddings model. And um, we need to beforehand obviously have it deploy in Azure OpenAI service. I deployed it as the same name as the model is called. And then this is a little of a speciality for Azure OpenAI service. We need to set here chunk size to one. This means that the underlying um, library, in this case LangChain, does not perform batch processing, but does uh, batch size one, meaning if you want to create five embeddings at once, that it will do one by one by one in order to calculate the embeddings. So now that we are connected, let's quickly run this. Okay, good. And then we can do the first test. So let's just take a text string like, this is just a test, and then we use the embedding to embed the query and we can print out the results. And if we run this, we should get a long number. And this is actually, or a vector to be more precise, and this vector represents actually the embedding of this text. We can also do a, um, let's actually do a print len of e, and we should see, if we scroll all the way down, that this vector has a dimensionality of 1,536 dimensions. So now since 
Embeddings allow us to measure the relatedness or similarity between two pieces of text. Let's actually quickly define a function that we can use to compare two pieces of text. So here I'm, I just wrote this get similarity from text function where you input two pieces of text. And once you do that, we calculate the embeddings for each using the same methodology we did before. And then in order to create or uh, calculate the similarity, we use the cosine similarity on both embeddings. And we typically use cosine similarity as this is the recommended way of comparing two, two embeddings. However, you could theoretically also use a different similarity or distance metric. And then what we do then is we print out the similarity between the two strings. So now um, let's walk through some examples here. And I've just tried to come up with some, some to get a little bit of an intuition what or how the similarity of the embeddings work. So here I'm calculating the similarity between boy and girl, boy and man, boy and woman, and then here also the similarity bet between Germany and Berlin, France and Paris, and Germany and Paris. And now, if we think about it, before we actually run it, we could consider or think about what the results of this operation might be. So if we, if we put these into relation, we should probably see that boy and girl are quite related concepts because we are talking about children here. Whilst if we compare boy to man, it's probably still fairly related, but it should be a little bit further away from when we compared boy and girl. And if we compare boy to a woman, the similarity should further decrease. And I think the same should happen in this example with the countries and city names. So if we compare Germany to Berlin and France to Paris, that probably should have somewhat similar similarity. However, if we then compare German to Paris, this definitely should have a lower similarity. So if we run this, we will see that boy and girl on, in the embedding space have quite a high similarity match, while boy and man have a little bit of a lower similarity match. That kind of seems intuitive to me. And then if we compare boy to woman, it has an even lower similarity uh, score. And I think that should have been, that's what we expected. And it's good that the embeddings actually work that way. Now, if we compare Germany to Berlin, we get 0 0.88 for similarity. And if we do France to Paris, we get 0, 0 0.89. So somewhat similar similarity scores as expected. But then if we compare Germany to Paris, obviously, it's not very related compared to the prior two. Um, so we get a lower similarity score. So that looks pretty reasonable. Now, um, what I've done is I've used GPT-3 just to create a short children's story. And I just um, copied here in story one, the first couple of sentences from it. And then story two is just the next couple of sentences from the story. And then I also generated an insurance clause that yeah, talks about in the event of any loss or damages. And what I wanted to do is now compare these two children's stories and then also compare the story to the insurance clause. And obviously, right, the two stories should have significantly higher similarity because they are significantly more related, it was actually from the same story, compared to the story and the insurance clause. So as we run this, we should see that here the two parts of the story are fairly related. And then if we actually check the first, first part of the story and the insurance clause, we get significantly lower similarity. And that, as we expected, was our intuition, right? And here it's obviously it seems pretty correct. Cool. So what can we do with this? And um, one thing that I thought of, um, why don't we use this to actually compare some um, movie descriptions and yeah, figure out how related two certain movies are because we can now use this to build a recommendation system. So what I've done here is I, I have a CSV with a bunch of movie um, uh, names and descriptions from Kaggle and I'm just loading the CSV and then I'm removing all the other columns. The only two columns we will keep is the original title and the overview. 
So if we run this, we should see the uh, the names of the movies and the short overview for all the movies. So this looks good. And as before, the first thing we would want to do now is take the overview and calculate the embeddings for each of the overviews. So I'm creating a new column called embedding and I'm just applying the embedding start embed query where we now embed all the um, movie overviews. Okay, so this took a little while, um, mostly because I'm actually running another job against the OpenAI API on Azure here in the background, so we hit the retry limit. But by the way, this is one of the benefits of Langchain because it's automatically retrying in case you hit the rate limit. So yeah, it ran a little bit longer than necessary, but that's fine. So if we now look at the data frame, we should see a new column with the embeddings. Okay, and that looks good, and that is the embedding of the overview column. So what we can now do is we can actually pick a movie and I looked in the data set before, by the way, this is a pretty small data set, only 500 movies. And I picked the movie Frozen because that was in the data set. And what we are doing here is we are now basically brute force comparing the embedding of the movie Frozen to all other embeddings and then getting a sorted list of the embeddings and then checking which movies were recommended. So in this case, I'm getting the embedding for Frozen here. Then I'm calculating again for every single movie that is in the data set the cosine similarity. And then lastly, I'm building a new data frame with recommendations that should have the movie titles that were recommended. And if we look at this, we obviously see that Frozen uh, has a similarity score of one. This is obvious because you compared the embedding with the same embedding, so that is exactly the same. But then if we look through the list, the next four movies are The Huntsman, Winter's War. That might not sound like a children movie, but again, right, we are just doing it based on the text and obviously the embeddings are not perfect and we did not take any other um, features of the movie into consideration, like for example, the category or the age recommendation or something like this. But um, next we get the Swarm Princess, Beauty and the Beast, and Wonder Woman, which seems all from a relatedness somewhat probably related to the description of Frozen. Surely not perfect, but um, again, right, we only used 500 movies here. Now, obviously, if you would want to build a real recommendation engine, right, you would not, or you probably could not do a brute force approach like we are doing here. So it probably would make sense to use a vector database and then just perform a vector search to find, uh, let's say, top 10 similar vectors to the vector that you are trying to get a recommendation for. But anyway, I think this is a pretty simple way to build a probably fairly powerful recommendation engine. Now, the last example that I've prepared here, just to get a little bit more intuition about how the embeddings actually work, is I've created an array here with a bunch of different city names. In fact, it's not 100, I think it's obviously a little bit less. And I've, I've put a bunch of um, yeah, Asian city names. Actually, this here probably should be down here, but it doesn't really matter. And then a few American city names. We can maybe add one more. Maybe let's add Chicago. And then a few European city names. And our intuition is as we create the embeddings for these cities and we then project them into three dim but dimensional space, we hopefully could see or will see some form of clusters because obviously a city like Beijing or Shanghai probably should be closer together compared to Shanghai to Amsterdam. So what we're doing here, we are just creating a data frame and then again we do the same thing to create embeddings for all the cities. Okay, done. And then in this case, in order to visualize it, you can use something more sophisticated like TSNE or something. Here I'm just using a PCA to reduce the dimensionality of the embeddings to, um, to three, so we can plot them in 3D. And then I'm just drawing a scatter plot um, in 3D where we put the names of each CD into the plot. And if we do this, we get to the following image. Um, what we see here, I think, is interesting. First of all, Los Angeles, New York, and San Francisco, they are all sitting up here 
close by each other and I think that was pretty expected because these cities are all large American cities. Then down here we have Hong Kong, Shanghai, Beijing, Jakarta and Bangkok. So down here we have all of the um, American. Um, that, so down here we have all the Asian cities. We also have Tokyo down here a little bit further away. Seems kind of reasonable because probably from a relatedness, these uh, these more uh, these Chinese cities are probably very different from Tokyo. And then here we have our pack of European cities. Even though I'm not sure if Chicago if it's actually down there. I mean, it's hard to tell from this 2D representation. Um, but that seems kind of reasonable. Then we some not sure why, but then we have here uh, Paris and Berlin quite a little bit on the side. But overall, I think this was what our intuition probably would have told you. And I think it's very interesting to see that the embeddings think more or less similar as we do as a union. So that's it for the embeddings. I hope this was useful. If you have ideas for new videos that I should do, just write it down in the comments and then see you in the next video.